about the new history makers, and it's you. Now, there is a saying, and the saying goes, the history is a past, but we learn from it. The future is a mystery. Today, it's a gift, and that's why it's a present. And I'm here to share my story with you to make sure that you understand that there's no difference between you and I. I'm just like every other entrepreneur. I'm scared. I have haters. I have fake people around me. I have naysayers. And usually, that's your family. <laughs> but I'm here to say that if I can make it, you can. And I'm here to share my story with you. I was born in Queens, New York. Raised in Queens. It's Queens now. There you go. Raised in Queens. And I was raised by an African American mom, and my dad was from Trinidad. And they had really strong word that Trinis, go up. You know, in El Paulo, you can say China, yo, it's what you doing. So I was, um, and, you know, and they had they had a very strong word ethic. I realized my mom used to have a can opener on the top of the kitchen. At the top of the kitchen, there was a two foot long can opener, and it said, "Think big." And she used to tell me, Damon, it takes just as much energy to think big as it does to think small. They would also tell me, Damon, your day job will not make you rich. It will be your homework that will make you rich. So I went on, and I always would see my mother and dad working. I worked a lot, too, as a little kid. I always tried to have a little hustle, because that's just what I, what, I, what, uh, what I learned. Now, life happened, and mom and dad decided it's not working. And Dad left when I was 11 or 12 years old. That didn't stop mom. She just became mom and dad. And how many mom and dads do you have here, moms? So I started working at a young age. Wintertime, I would shovel snow. Summertime, I would cut the grass. And I would do whatever and anything else I could do. Mom was still working two, three jobs herself. And then she would still basically work with me as much as possible. Now, when I started getting around 15, 16, this new music started coming out of the Bronx. And I guess because the rappers used to go hip, hop, hip, 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 they started calling it hip hop. And it started to come into Queens, and I loved it. It was this, it was these young kids, the, this energy of the street, and it wasn't something that you just listen to. Hip hop is not something you, you do, it's something you live. It was the way they walked, they talked, they, you know, uh, Everything, the food they ate, they would talk about. Everything, they just brag about it. And I loved it. And then I started to see like this guy in my neighborhood named Russell Simmons, he was driving around these big fancy cars. Now the only people I had to look up in my neighborhood were drug dealers and things of that nature. Not because there wasn't African American people who were hard workers. But the hard workers, they got up six in the morning, they left and went to work, and they got home 10 o'clock at night, took care of their family and their kids, and got back up. So there was no praise for them. The only people you saw hanging out were the drug dealers with the big cars. And you didn't even realize that all those drug dealers would probably be around maybe one, two years, and it's another drug dealer. But that same hard working guy, they got up every day and supported his family, and that hard working woman were the ones who were really the superstars of the community. But I didn't have that to look to. So I saw Russell Simmons driving around and I said, wow. But it was a magical time in general. Because you know what? There was this boxer, he was short, old too, he had a really bad lisp. He had a really bad lisp. His name was Mike Tyson, he came out of Brooklyn. And he was the youngest champion then. Then there was a guy, a guy with a bald head, and, he saw, and you know, back then, the basketball players really wore poom poom shorts, right? So the guy with, the, there was this guy with a bald head, he stuck his tongue out, he flew higher than anybody could fly, and he wore nice long shorts. His name was Michael Jordan, right? This is still around the same time, 85, 86. A comedian decides to put a program on TV, and he says, you know what, I'm gonna put an African-American family on TV where no, the kids aren't on drugs, the kids name ain't Pookie, they're not gang banging, and the father's gonna be a doctor, and the mother's gonna be a lawyer. And they're black and they live in Brooklyn. And everybody said, that's not possible. 
It was the number one show for seven years in a row and one of the longest running sitcoms in history. And that is when you got to rethink possible. Um, I'm not going to take it a step further because that time was so magical. There was this guy with, you know, he had his big glasses, not knees. He made this movie called, uh, what is it? Spike Lee Wolves movie? Do the right thing. A little weirdo, right? He made, he made, he came out with that movie. So the energy was just incredible. Now, there was a lady at Chicago and oh, bro, it was just such a magical time. Now, we grew up with three networks, historically. ABC, NBC, CBS. But they said it wasn't possible to launch a fourth network. Okay, well, you know what, Fox? decided to launch a fourth network, and guess what they did? They used only African-American shows to create an entire network. So they came out with In Living Color, Rock, and who knows the third black show that launched Fox? Cops. But you know, we, it wasn't it was by purpose. It's just what they decided to, to put on, right? But anyway, it's a magical time. You know, I lived in Hollis Queens. There was a guy named LL Cool J. He kept licking his lips. You know, baby, come on, we're on tour. You know what I'm saying? Come on, we're on tour, baby. L, baby. L. So we went on tour with him, and we loved it. And, uh, you know, I would carry his bags. I would push speakers around. Can I have some water, please? I'd push speakers around, do whatever I could. Now, I used to come uptown to Harlem to dap and dance. And I used to come on here to find out fashion. I was in Queens. We was cool. Where Harlem was where it's at. Always. I used to always come on here. I used to buy clothes. I used to go on those tours. And you know what? The kids in North Carolina, South Carolina, Philadelphia, they would buy them off my back. I said, wow, hold on. I got a little business here. I can go on the road, wear the clothes, sell it to them. I don't even got to bathe. And then I make a little bit of money. So I was happy about that. So, you know, I would start doing that on a regular basis. And, um, and when I came back to New York, I started saying, you know, maybe there's a, there's a business here, you know? So, anyway, I kept doing that and I kept working regular jobs. All of a sudden, a boo company made a statement. And the statement said, we don't sell our boots to drug dealers. Now, I'm not gonna say the name, but now, this is about knowing your customer because you guys are going to be entrepreneurs and you guys are going to be history makers. And this is about knowing your customer. If you make the best boot in the world, then when somebody is a hiker or a construction worker, they don't have to buy a new pair for two, three years because it's the best boot in the world. But if there is a community that is buying your boots and if they get stuck on it, they throw it away, they're buying three boots a month. And that is the 80-20 rule. 20% of your business is 80% of your profit, and 80% is 20%. Once they said that, they went into turmoil. People stopped buying boots. But you know, I, I think it may have been taken out of context, and they had no problem saying, give racism the boot. But I went home that day, and I remember having a nice, fresh 40-year-old, fresh or cold. None of my boys were around, so I couldn't, like, they weren't even going to take none of it. One of my basics, I came up with the name. Excuse me, I need this. Sorry, sorry. One of my basics, I came up with the name, sold it on the shirt. I was ready to take on the world. I put on the shirt, I put on the hat. I walked outside. I was outside for about three hours. I walked down to Jamaica. Jamaica Avenue is where I live by. And I was walking. Mm. Mm, mm. Right there on my shirt. Boo foo. <laughs> Buy us for us. So, this girl I used to date, her brother was gay. And he came over and gave me the biggest, sloppiest, wettest kiss on my cheek and said, I always knew that about you. And I said, what are you talking about, boo? He said, boo foo, baby. He said, down south, boo foo means a lot. So, uh, 
I, I had to rethink the plan as well as change my phone number. Anyway. But you know, that brings up something else. You always have to be ready to recalibrate your plan. Definitely. Anyway, so now, creative fool. I went, went up to town again to buy me some hats because this, this group named De La Soul was wearing these hats. It was a sleeve hat, a little tie on the top, right? I went up to town. I couldn't find it anywhere. I bought one. It was $20. I went back home. I said, you know what? Mom taught me how to sew back in the days. We didn't have it like that, so I had to sew my pants, hem my pants, whatever the case is. I can make this hat. I made a couple of those hats. And I remember going outside, and I went over to the Coliseum. And I sold $800 worth of those hats in one day. That was more money than I ever seen in my life. And I remember driving home, counting that money, with my little beat up car, and BOW! I hit a car in the back. Now who wants to tell me how much it costs to fix that guy's car? Hey, my house. But you know what? If you lose, don't lose the lesson. The lesson was that with my bare hands, sweat, and tears, that I made something that everybody else wanted. And I made it legally. And I could do this for the rest of my life and never have to look over my back. And it was something I loved to do. So FUBU was created.